What's up, guys? Hey, do you like that picture of me spitting on the Quran? You guys like it? Here. This is for Mahmoud Nus Khan, whose uncle molested him, who, whose mother is a Shia whore, and who likes to watch children pornography and beat children like Muhammad, his dog, bastard who's burning in hell, molested a nine-year-old and beat her like a dog whose Satan molested him. This is for you, Mahmoud Nukhaz, on your Quran, this trash. May the Lord Jesus destroy it as he destroyed Muhammad on your Quran. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. <laughs> he can't because there's a 60 minute second delay. So, we'll, but, hey, Hope, how are you, brother? Good to see you, man. I was about to reach out to you to see how you're doing. So, we're back now. Now, glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. At least we have part 5A still there. Now, we're going to continue where we left off, and I'm going to post the link to part 5A in the description box. And post the link to this in part 5A. So we're going to continue where we left off. For those of you who are listening, let me repeat what I said by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ about remaining Protestant. Are you with me? Let me repeat what I said about remaining Protestant. If you stay a Protestant, then due to sola scriptura, tota scriptura, you're going to have a hard time affirming everlasting conscious torment. And maybe to you, that's okay. Right? That's okay. Right? You may be okay with that. That's fine. You'd rather prefer annihilationism. But my point is, this is the result of sola scriptura and tota scriptura. It's not attacking the Bible. God's, the Bible is God's perfect word. But it was given to a church. And I'm going to show you that church, that our Lord, our Lord committed his scriptures to. When you isolate the Bible from the church that's been around since the time of the apostles, okay, whatever that church is in your mind, we know it's not Protestantism because even Protestants admit the Reformation started in the 16th century. So historically, they can't go any earlier than the Reformers. But they'll acknowledge the Catholic Church was there before the Reformation. The Orthodox Church was there before the Reformation, right? All the various Orthodox churches, even the Syrian Church. So they cannot lay claim to being ancient. They can't. Are you with me there? Are you guys understanding? It's going to be a little slow. That's okay. Because we thank Mahmoud Nus Khan because he only drove us to want to bury his dog Muhammad like his uncle molested him. May the Father, the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit be glorified. Okay. Now. So, if you isolate the Bible from the church that it was entrusted to, a church that was started by the Spirit through the apostles, then applying sola scriptura, tota scriptura, you cannot definitively condemn a view as heretical and throw someone out of the body of Christ as these books prove. Are you with me there? What does it tell you about the state of Protestantism that you have Protestant publishers having to publish books presenting the different views of a particular subject, right? Because these are views that are widespread and mainline, and they have to be accepted and endorsed because you cannot condemn any of these views as heretical. You with me there? All right. Now. This book that Chris Date sent me not only presents the toughest arguments for annihilationism from the Old and New Testaments and responds to the best arguments for everlasting conscious torment, they even have a section on the early church fathers. See, they realize, you understand the principle. What's the principle? I'm going to show it to you. This is all preparatory, so brethren, be patient with me. Be patient with me. This is all preparatory, okay? Because we're going to go into a lot of stuff I have to tread lightly. I can't rush through this because I'm going to have to give an account to the Lord, right? Okay. Now, follow with me what I'm about to tell you. They realize that since the Bible was entrusted to the church, and the church has been there since the time of the apostles, 
You cannot ignore the early church. You can't do it. Because these are the men and women who preserved the scriptures, who explained the scriptures, who wrote up the scriptures, who taught the scriptures, who defended the scriptures, even dying for their preservation. So you have to then look to that church and see what their view was about the nature of punishment at the last day. With me there, you guys, so far? You understand? So guess what they do? This is why I say someone has to do a very thorough, exhaustive search into the first 400 years of the church. Why I say 400 years? Because in the 5th century, that's when the schism started. Thorough, meticulous, honest search to see if there was a unanimity of opinion or a consensus or were they all over the map, which means that since there wasn't a consensus or a unanimity of opinion, that's the Holy Spirit allowing churches to agree to disagree and still view one another as brothers and sisters in the faith. They think they've done it for you. Why? Because look, here's a section. And I'm going to read their summation of the Apostolic Fathers. Okay, here it is. I haven't read this book yet. I'm looking at it here and there. Hopefully, if God gives me time, I will. Let me find the section on the church fathers. Okay, hell and evangelical unity. Okay, I just saw it too. I was just reading it, man. Where was it? Yep. Here you go. Chapter 19. Do you see it? Chapter 19. What does it say? You see it, chapter 19? Conditionalism in the early church. See? Okay, now. They're going to break down the different periods of church history. So they mention Clement of Rome, right? Ignatius of Antioch. Ignatius of Antioch. Okay. Barnabas, the epistle of Barnabas. Okay. And then a summation of the apostolic fathers. Are you ready? So they look at the epistle of Barnabas to see if he says anything about judgment. The letters by Ignatius, Ignatius of Antioch, okay? And the letter of Clement of Rome. Look what the subtitle is. Do you see, do you see the subtitle? Clement of Rome, neither innate immortality nor eternal torment. So according to their research, Clement does not teach that we are, by nature, immortal. We are immortal by grace. Now, no one should object to that. You guys, are you guys getting bored with this or are you okay with this? Are you guys okay if I'm breaking this down and treading lightly? Or are you bored with this? Because I'm here to serve you. I want to make sure you're okay with this. You okay with it? Because I'm explaining the issues. You thought it was going to be easy, right? You thought my discussion of hell was going to be very simple. No. It's very complicated. Okay. What does conditional immortality mean? Not innate immortality. And we all agree with conditional immortality. What does that mean? We are not by our nature immortal, meaning that we necessarily exist forever. We are immortal by grace. God is the only being who by his very nature is necessarily immortal. This is 1 Timothy 6.15, talking about Jesus, who alone possesses immortality. He alone is immortal. If you're a creature, that means you're brought into existence, and your existence depends on another. And God, who brought you into existence, graciously, favorably, grants you immortality. But that God can wipe you out of existence and no one can stop him because he alone by his very nature is immortal and can never be otherwise. That's called conditional immortality. You with me there? You understand the difference? Conditional immortality. Everyone got it? Before I move on? Therefore... 
I'm buffering now. I don't know why. Hmm. All right. Therefore, more into the Father, Son, Spirit, God, and Angels. Talk about spiritual warfare, guys. Ooh, talk about Satan attacking. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Talk about Satan attacking, huh? Wow. Talk about warfare. Satan's upset. May the Lord Jesus, who is almighty over creation, preserve this session. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Crush Satan under your feet, Lord Jesus. Yep, that's 1 Timothy 6, 15. If you read Kiddie Dayson, 1 Timothy 6, 14 and 16, which I can only read, I can't post anymore because it's going to take too long. Guys, you see what's happening? See the spiritual warfare? You see the buffering? It's buffering for me. I don't know what to tell you. It's buffering for me. Sure? It's very bad for me, man. All right, let's see. God, let me see if I'm going to the Spirit. I don't know. Hold on one second, guys. I don't know what's it's for me. It's buffering really bad. I mean, it's like I can't. It's not even working. You guys sure it's working for you guys? And I can't even connect to the modem because this is a different type of Mac. All right, let's see. Talk about spiritual war for my goodness. Satan never stops. Lord Jesus, crush him, rebuke him, and cover us by your blood, Lord Jesus. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. Hold on, brethren. Let me see. La 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 la. All right, let's see. Man, dude. Let's see. All right, how's the lighting now? Let's see how it is. All right. Everything good? All right, how about now? Is the lighting too too strong? All right, one second, guys. Oh, boy. Please, Father, please, Lord Jesus Christ, please, Holy Spirit, constrain us, control us, crucify our flesh, rebuke Satan. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right. All right, brethren. Ah, oh, boy. Thank you, McVine. I just saw your comment, huh? Yeah, if I turn it off, watch what's going to happen now. Watch here. Okay, watch here, sister. Okay, let's turn it off. Now watch what's going to happen. Pray against the distractions. Boy, is this war warfare. Okay, now watch what's going to happen. Get it, Asa. Watch. Is that what you want? All right, you see? Turn off the light. Now it's even darker. See that? Is that what you want, Kitty Day soon? Is that what you guys want? No, I can't read, actually, but that's what I'm saying. Fitting for the subject matter. So we got to get the men. Talk about warfare, dude. No, that was it. That's the kitchen light. There is no other light. See now, guess what, Kitty Day soon? I'm now going to turn it on. Ah, 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 ah. We were saying it all along. And then let me say hi to Momo. Let me go urinate on Momo. That's what he deserves. On a moonlight day. La, 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 la. That's what happens when you have a professional studio and you don't have state yeah. of the art technology and you don't make millions, Matt Brad. Right? Sucks being me. Sucks being me. That's what happens when you don't have state of the art technology. Catholic answers. Matt Frad, Pines with Aquinas. 
and you just got to work out of, out of your kitchen, right? Right? <laughs> All right. So now let's come back here. And I still won't be able to read because I'm going to be blind. Please, Father, be glorified. Son of God, Lord Jesus, be glorified. Holy Spirit, be glorified. All right. Here's their summation. Here's their summation of the church, church, the apostolic fathers. Okay. Here's their summation, right? Okay. So here, let's go. Oh, boy. That's what happens, guys. We need to have a professional union. And I live in an apartment. The lighting in this apartment sucks, by the way, guys. I don't know if you know it. It's terrible. The lighting here is terrible, but what are you going to do? And pray for me because, the Lord willing, by the end of the year, I may have to move. It's getting too expensive. Now, watch what they say, summation of the fathers, okay? Summation of the fathers. Right here, summation of the apostolic fathers. When I say fathers, the apostolic fathers. You see it? Summation of the apostolic fa fathers, okay? What do they mean by apostolic fathers? You guys want me to go in depth or are you guys getting bored? I'm here to serve you. May the Spirit be pleased to work through me to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and not be a nuisance to my neighbors. Please, Holy Spirit, you're the teacher. Bless this session. Rebuke these demons. Crush them and teach them your fear. Deliver them to our hands. All right. The early church is divided into different periods. You have the apostolic fathers. The apostolic fathers means that generation of Christians who knew the apostles and were contemporary with the apostles. That's why they're called apostolic fathers. Notice apostolic, the fathers who are contemporaries with the apostles. They lived at the time of the apostles and knew them directly. Ignatius is an apostolic father because he lived at the time of the apostles and was discipled by them and <clears throat> appointed by them. Polycarp is an apostolic father. The Epistle of Barnabas is an apostolic father writing. It's a writing of the apostolic father because it's written at the time of the apostles and their contemporaries. So it's classified as falling under the period of apostolic fathers. Clement of Rome, he too is an apostolic father because he is the bishop of Rome who is a contemporary of the apostles and is writing shortly thereafter. In fact, Many scholars believe that Clement is the one mentioned by name, by Paul, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, where Paul says that his name is in the book of heaven. You with me there? There goes the buffering again. Yeah, let me show you another one. Office of the Spirit. Ooh, man. All right, everyone got it? Let me know if you're hearing me. So after looking at the apostolic fathers... After looking at the apostolic fathers, here's what they say. You ready? It has often been asserted that the dogma of the innate immortality of the soul. Innate means that you are necessarily immortal. None of us believe that. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, you don't believe that you are necessarily immortal. You are immortal by grace, by favor, by mercy. God created you and graciously sustains you immortally, but he can wipe you out of existence if he wants. Okay. It has often, it has often been asserted that the dogma of the innate immortality of the soul and the eternal torment of the wicked, as later taught by Tertullian, even then I don't believe Tertullian taught that you are necessarily immortal. You are immortal by creation, by God's grace. But be that as it may. And finally established by Augustine was always the pos position of the early Christian church. So they're saying that's the assertion, that the church has already believed this. Now look at their challenge. Orthodox, here's the challenge. Catholics, here's the challenge. But the scholarly invest investigations of Henry Constable, Anglican Prebendary of Cork, Ireland, led him to reply with positiveness, we wholly deny it. Nope, you're wrong. Prior to Tertullian and prior to Augustine making it doctrine, the early Christians, the apostolic fathers, did not teach everlasting conscious torment. So this man claims. And after his exhaustive 
study of the apostolic fathers, Constable declared that they were just as much opposed to the everlasting torment theories of Augustine as to the theories of origin and his universal restoration concept. Here is the key statement of Constable's sweeping conclusion, and they quote him. From beginning to end of them, the Apostolic Fathers, there is not one word said of that immortality of the soul which is so prominent in the writings of the later fathers. <clears throat> immortality is by them asserted to be peculiar to the redeemed. What he's saying is the Apostolic Fathers claim only the redeemed, believers in Christ, are immortal. Everyone else will be destroyed. This is his claim. The punishment of the wicked is by them emphatically declared to be everlasting. Now watch what they mean by everlasting punishment. Okay, Not one stray expression of theirs can be interpreted as giving any countenance to the theory of restoration, meaning universalism, Right after purgatorial suffering, the fire of hell is with them as with us, meaning the conditionalist, an unquenchable one. But its issue is with them as with scripture, destruction, death, loss of life. Did you understand what he just said? He's saying the apostolic fathers agree with the annihilationist, the damned will be wiped out of existence. Only the redeemed will live forever. So then, the author remarks on const, const, Constable's claim. Constable even went so far, look at his challenge, as to issue this challenge to his contemporaries, which appears in each of the six editions of his major treatise. So he challenged people. Quote, here's his challenge. We challenge our opponents to controvert our view of them in a single particular, end quote. So he's challenging you, me, refute my claim that the apostolic fathers taught that the damned will die and be wiped out of existence and only the redeemed will live forever. Now notice what the author then says. And it should be added that no one during his lifetime when discussion over the question was rife, ever undertook to disprove his contention. You got it? Charles, this shows you that you're being naive if you don't think they already have arguments in Matthew 25, 46. Come on, brother. Be a little better than that. You don't think they're reading the Bible and know your arguments? In fact, I linked to two articles where I address Matthew 24, 25, 46. That's not going to help your case, brother. Speaking of which, let me show you what they admit about Matthew 25, 46, quoting Augustine. Yes, that means your punishment is you will be punished for a period of time, but then wiped out of existence, you'll cease to exist. Are you with me there? Everyone got it? Let me now read what they say about Augustine's view of Matthew 25, 46, and then we get into the meat of the matter. Remember what I said, I'm not agreeing with them. Right, my journey is leading me to the ancient churches, and we're going to now go into the Orthodox position, and we're going to go into the Catholic position in the Catechism, and then we're going to go into the Bible. You see why I'm going slow? Everyone got it? You see why I'm going slow? Do you guys okay if I go slow, or is it too much and it's boring? If it's boring, I'll stop honestly because I'm doing it for you guys. You may not want to learn this, that's fine. I'm not going to get upset, okay. So let's go now. Hold on. One second. Let me do this. Okay, let's go now. I got I need the light again. To what they say about Augustine's view of Matthew 25, 40, 25, 46, which is what the brother's alluding to. Here it is. I'm gonna read mid-sentence. Here it is. Pages 191, 192. Talking about Matthew 25, 46, and I'll go more in depth on what they say eternal punishment is. But now they're going to remark on Augustine's view. Okay, let's read. This 
consideration may reasonably raise the question whether the eternal and unquenchable fire of the final judgment, Matthew 8, 18, Mark 9, 44, will be eternally endured by those who are consigned to it. So does the eternal fire, meaning a fire that will torment you forever, eternal punishment, is it a punishment that's never-ending punishment? Okay. And by the assertion regarding those who suffer it, that the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. Right? So does that mean it is never-ending punishment? Such terminology can, notice the concession, brethren, can certainly bear the inference that the torment of the damned in hell will be endlessly continued. Yeah, it can mean that. We can see that. And this inference has been thought, as was mentioned, to provide an appropriate balance for the doctrine of everlasting life, which, as is universally agreed, the redeemed are to enjoy without end or, or term. Right? It is a balance on which, for example, Augustine insisted. Referring to Matthew 25, 41, he exclaimed, quoting Augustine now, what a fond fancy it is to suppose that eternal punishment means long continued punishment while eternal life means life without end. Both destinies, he maintained, quote, are correlative. On the one hand, punishment eternal. On the other hand, life eternal, end quote. Consequently, right, to say, let me show you what it goes on to say. The life, quoting Augustine, eternal shall be endless. Punishment eternal shall come to an end is the height of absurd absurdity. End quote. So then the author says, the logic of this interpretation is sound enough so long as it is punishment that is spoken of as being endless. Now, what does he mean? I hope you're not getting bored. I have to do this to set it up. What does he mean? He means Augustine's argument goes like this. In Matthew 25, 46, our Lord says, the righteous will go into everlasting life, whereas the wicked will go into everlasting punishment. It is foolish and stupid to say that life is never ending. Life of the righteous will never end. But the punishment of the wicked will end after a period of time when both are described as being everlasting in nature. That was Augustine's argument. You get the point? And they're conceding. Yes, you can see it that way. We concede. That is a valid way of understanding it, but not necessarily because there's a better way. Everyone got it? You see how complicated, how confused Protestantism has made the issue? And for good reason. What do I mean for good reason? The Bible itself says in 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16, 2 Peter 3, 15 to 16, that Paul, in all the letters that he wrote, wrote with the wisdom given to him, obviously, by God. And Peter says that there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which untaught and unstable men distort to their destruction like they do the other scriptures. So the Bible itself tells you there are things in the Bible not as easy and clear, not as comprehensible and easy to understand. This is a, something the Bible says of itself. Are you with me there? The Bible itself states, because we believe all the books of the Bible were there by God's design, using the church to discover what those books were and preserve them. The Bible itself says, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, the Bible itself teaches there are things in it, not everything, some things. Well, how much is some? And the list of over 73 books, Right? Hundreds, thousands of places. What's some in view of this massive library of books? Right? But point being, there are places in Scripture that are difficult to understand, not as clear and comprehensible. And who focuses on the difficult portions of Scripture? Peter says those who are untaught and unstable. Everyone got it? Are you guys learning, brethren? 
I know there's a 60 second delay, but it's okay. We, we endure and overcome by the power of Christ. And as long as you're learning, as long as you're thinking with me, as long as you're being challenged, as long as it's stretching you and making you go deeper, then glory to the Holy Spirit. That's his work and his work is perfect. Okay, so if you're going to follow the route of sola scriptura, tota scriptura, you will find yourself in no man's land when it comes to this issue. Because I'm letting you know, had the Lord not enabled me without me resisting the work of the Spirit in my heart to want to return to the ancient paths, I really think I would have ended up becoming an annihilationist, annihilationist because sadly, the arguments from the other Protestants in affirming everlasting conscious torment, very weak. So now you have one of two choices. One of two choices. Now, coming back to the Apostolic Fathers, they're claiming the Apostolic Fathers did not teach everlasting conscious torment. Some were silent. Others were clear. And you'll find this throughout the first 400 years of church history. This is why a Catholic or an Orthodox needs to prayerfully seek the Spirit and devote himself or herself to just studying this issue, what the fathers taught about post-mortem or punishment at the last day by examining the writings of the fathers, theologians, apologists, and writers for the first 400 years. Why the first 400 years? Because that's when the church became schismatic. Schism broke away. Everyone with me there? Because they're claiming... That if you look at the early church, from the Apostolic Fathers onward, you'll find a variety of opinions, like Origen teaching universalism, right? Others teaching an annihilationism, and still others, like Tashian, teaching everlasting conscious torment, which then became the dominant view due to the influence of Augustine. So you have two options in front of you. Everyone with me there? You have two options in front of you. You can remain Protestant and affirm sola scriptura, tota scriptura, and vacillate. One day you may be an annihilationist, a conditionalist. Another day you may affirm everlasting conscious torment. Still another day you may become a universalist. That's the fruit of sola scriptura, tota scriptura. Or you can choose to return to these churches that are ancient, that were there before the Protestant Reformation, that have a pedigree that takes them back to the apostles, and if you're convinced of that church, then you subject your thinking to what the church teaches about judgment and be at peace with it. But do not bring your Protestantism into that church and cause more division. You understand what's being presented in front of you? What lays uh, in front of you? One of two choices. You either stay Protestant, sola scriptura, tota scriptura, and vacillate like me, everlasting conscious torment. But wow, these arguments are powerful and persuasive. And I even read, right? You saw I'm not lying. This book was sent to me courtesy of Christopher Date. God bless him. And you saw what he said, right? He's praising me for being a Berean and being open enough to consider whether annihilationism is true. Because I was really challenged. Their arguments are strong grammatically, contextually. But because now I am convinced that my journey is going to take me to the ancient paths, both Orthodox and Catholic have already codified their view. In other words, even though there may have been debates early on in church history, once these churches settled on a view that's it. It's sealed. It's codified. Don't bring your Protestantism into that church and disagree. Leave if you don't like it. Go back to Protestantism. No one's putting your gun to your head to become Orthodox or Catholic or stay a Syrian church of the East. If you of your own volition believe this is the church of the Lord and this is where you want to remain, then that means you're telling the Lord, I will subject my thoughts to what the church teaches and correct myself to align my thinking with the church because no one's putting a gun to my head to do it. I'm doing it of my own volition because I believe this is the church. 
Otherwise, go back to Protestantism. Okay? Yeah, let me show you. I hope I'm not too loud. Okay? We got it? So these are the issues before us. These are the issues before us. Now, what does the Catholic Church teach? What does the Catholic Church teach about hell? Let's see. Here's the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, I link to all these in the description box. Here's the link. Okay? Catechism of the Catholic Church. You ready? Let's read. Catechism of the Catholic Church. Too bad I need glasses. Part 1. The Profession of Faith, Section 2, I, the Creeds, Chapter 3, I Believe in the Holy Spirit, Article 12, I Believe in Life Everlasting, and then 4, Hell. Are we ready? Now let's talk about what the Catholic Church means, and we're going to talk about the Orthodox. All of this is necessary information. Please, I hope you're benefiting from this. Let me know. I don't want you to tickle my ears. If not, I don't need to talk about this, honestly. I'm here to be used of the Spirit to serve you in these issues. Okay, so you ready for me to proceed? Everyone on board? Okay, here it is. There's the link again. It's in the description box. So let's let's read and I want to show you what the Orthodox teaches. We cannot be united, paragraph 1033, with God unless we freely choose to love him. But we cannot love God if we sin gravely against him against our neighbor, or against ourselves. And they quote scripture and statements from the early church. He who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murder has eternal life abiding in him. Our Lord warns us that we shall be separated from him if we fail to meet the serious needs of the poor and the little ones who are his brethren. To die in mortal sin without repenting and accepting God's merciful love means remaining separated from him forever ever by our own free choice. This state of definitive self-exclusion from communion with God and the blessed is called hell. Paragraph 1034. Jesus often speaks of Gehenna, of the unquenchable fire, reserved for those who to the end of their lives refuse to believe and be converted where both soul and body can be lost. Jesus solemnly proclaims that he will send his angels and they will gather all evildoers and throw them into the furnace of fire. They're quoting scripture, by the way. And that he will pronounce the condemnation. Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire. Paragraph 1035, brethren. Listen to this. Paragraph 1035. Okay. The teaching of the church affirms the existence of hell and its eternity. There you get it? There you go. Catholics, it's been settled for you. Paragraph 1035. Paragraph 1035. It's been settled for you. The teaching of the church affirms the existence of hell and its eternity. Why didn't that show up? I don't know. Or did it show up? No, it didn't show up, well, sadly. Okay. And it's eternity. Why didn't it show up? Oh, because I didn't quote it. Sorry. Ah, Lord have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, so the Spirit. Here it is. Are you there? The teaching of the church affirms on its eternity. Settled, Catholics. No debate. Settled. If you're going to be a Catholic, you have to believe hell is eternal. If you don't believe it, leave and go find you another church. Everyone got it? You who are Catholics, you who are Catholics of your own volition, no one put a gun to your head. Robo, ask me that again. I'm going to have to block you. No one put a gun to your head. You of your own volition have chosen to remain a Catholic. It's been settled for you. You don't bring your Protestantism into the church like Luther did. You don't like it, leave. Okay, let me finish it now. Sit. Simple, right? You can leave. 
Immediately after death, the souls of those who die in a state of mortal sin descend into hell, where they suffer the punishments of hell, eternal fire. The chief punishment of hell is eternal separation from God, in whom alone man can possess the life and happiness for which he was created and for which he longs. Paragraph 1036. The affirmation of sacred scripture and the teachings of the church on the subject of hell are a call to the responsibility incumbent upon man to make use of his freedom in view of his eternal des destiny. So you're being called, use your free will to avoid hell. They are at the same time an urgent call to conversion. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to light. And those who find it are few. And then it has a paragraph, and I believe it's quoting. Let's see what it's quoting. 617. Lumen Gentium. Lumen Gentium. Since we know neither the day nor the hour, we should follow the advice of the Lord and watch constantly so that when the single course of our earthly life is completed, we may merit to enter with him into the marriage feast and be numbered among the blessed and not like the wicked and slothful servants be ordered to depart into the eternal fire and to the outer darkness where men will weep and gnash their teeth. Final paragraph, 1037. God predestines no one to go to hell. Bye-bye, Calvinism. For this, a willful turning away from God, a mortal sin, is necessary and persistence in it until the end. Catch it? He does not predestine you to go to hell. He does not predestine you to go to hell. But this is the consequence of you persisting in rebelling and turning away from him. Right? All right. In the Eucharistic liturgy and in the daily prayers of her faithful, the church implores the mercy of God, who does not want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. And they quote, Father, accept this offering from your whole family. Grant us your peace in this life. Save us from final damnation and count us among those you have chosen. So Catholics, this is what you're supposed to believe. Now, can I show you what the Orthodox teach? Guys, let me know honestly. I feel like I'm boring you guys. I feel bad because of all the distractions and nuisances. May the Lord Jesus rebuke Satan and confirm by his spirit if he wants me to co continue. Now, you want to see what the Orthodox believe? I have a YouTube clip. That's four minutes we're going to play. Okay. Here is the link. GoArch.org, Heaven and Hell. The Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. Here's the link. Let me now show you what it says, and I'll play the video. Let me know if you can hear it, or I have to play it on Safari. All right. Well, I'll play it here. I'll show it to you here. But let me read what it says. Quote, many people think that heaven and hell are the places God sends us to either reward or punish us. But Orthodox Christians do not believe in this two-story model of the universe. We believe that God is present in all places and filling all things, and that what we interpret as salvation or damnation is actually our response to an experience of God's unconditional love. End quote. You guys got it? What's amazing is yesterday, unbeknownst to me, the Lord is my witness, I decided today to search what the Orthodox position is on hell. And if you go back and listen to part four, I proved from scripture in part four, God is present in hell to punish. Revelation 14, 9 to 11, specifically verse 10. And I also proved that the fire that ignites hell is God. He's the fire. The fire is his anger. The fire comes from him, which the Orthodox Church interprets as one of God's uncreated energies. You know, the essence energy distinction. And today I find out that's what the Orthodox Church teach, teaches. That's what the Orthodox Church teaches. I found out today. Okay. So let me play the clip and then I'm going to read another thing. This is all preparatory, brethren. I have to prepare you. I can't just dive into it. Okay. 
Here it is. So let me play it on my phone. I think it'll be better if I play it on my phone. Let's do here. Okay, let's see. Oops, sorry. I just clicked the wrong one. All right, let's see. I want to get it. Yeah, right here. Open up here. This is what I was reading. You see it here? It's what I was reading. Now I'm going to play the video. It's on YouTube. Okay, tell me if you can hear. Hey everybody, this is Steve, and we've spent the last couple of weeks talking about who Christ is and what he saved us from. The next step is to talk about what salvation is, and we're going to start with some misconceptions about heaven and hell. Many Listen. people think that if we follow the rules God gives us, he rewards us with an eternity in heaven. And if we disobey those rules, God punishes us with an eternity in heaven in hell so for lots of people salvation is about going to heaven and not going to hell but that's not how the orthodox church sees it my favorite summary of the orthodox view comes from father stephen freeman who has a blog and a podcast for ancient faith links in the doobly -doo. father stephen points out that many people see the universe as being made up of two stories or floors so according to this view we're here in this world on the ground floor and God and heaven are somewhere up above us on the second floor. People sometimes add a third floor to the mix, seeing hell as somewhere down in the basement. They see heaven. Hmm. Why did it stop? Oh, it's, it's buffering. Ah, oh, got it. Heaven is the place God lives. Oh, my goodness. Come on, dude. Hell is a place God isn't, a place ruled by the devil, and this world is a place we eventually leave. But Orthodox Christians believe in a one story universe. Where God is present in all places and filling all things. Filling all things. We believe that God made the world and blessed the world and called it good. He didn't make it so that it could be abandoned or destroyed. He made it so that it could be transformed. He made it to be his kingdom. It is in this world and not any other world. It is this life and not some other life that were given to man to be a sacrament of the divine presence. Given as communion with God. And it is only through this world, this life, by transforming them into communion with God, that man was to be. As Christians, our goal is not to escape this life, to shuffle off this mortal coil and climb the stairs to the second floor where God is. Our goal is to offer ourselves and the whole world to God, not just for the life of humanity, but for the life of the entire world. So if this world is the kingdom of God, or rather is in the process of becoming, being transformed into God's eternal kingdom, then heaven and hell aren't places we get sent to. They're not places at all. And what we interpret as salvation or damnation is actually our response to an experience of God's unconditional love. As we read in the Gospels, God makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. That very same son, depending on our state, can either warm us or burn us. That, that? very same rain depending on our state, can either satisfy our thirst or drown us. It's the same sun, the same rain. The difference is our response. The See difference that? is how we use the freedom God has given us. Because every choice we make shapes who we are. And we'll respond to God's love differently, depending on our spiritual state. As St. Isaac the Syrian wrote, love is given to all. But the power of love works in two ways. It torments sinners. Even as happens here when a friend suffers from a friend, but it becomes a source of joy for those who have observed its duties. We can understand this a bit better with an image a lot of church fathers use and think about God as fire. If we put a piece of dry wood in the fire, it will be burnt See that? and reduced to ash. But if we put a piece of gold in the fire, it will get hot like the fire and glow like the flame. It will still be gold, but by being united with the fire, it will be transformed and have the heat and light of the fire. And this union and transformation are important because the world isn't God's eternal kingdom on its own, just like we aren't immortal on our own. You see, salvation see? is also about transformation. And as we'll see next week, that only happens in our union with Christ. So yeah. let's be the bee and see that we live in a one story universe be the bee and live orthodoxy remember to like and subscribe i'll see you all next week okay now you got it right now i give a link to oh, shit. i give a link 
to another Orthodox page that says the same thing. So here's the other link. Now I'm going to sum up the Orthodox position because I saw this is the view because I saw it on several Orthodox sites and I just discovered it today. Here's another one. This one too, I'm not going to read it. I'll just give you the link for the sake of time. St. James Orthodox Church. And it describes hell the same way this young man did. I say young because it seems like he's younger than me. So here you go. Here's the other link. Now let me sum up what he said. In the Orthodox position, and in this article, it makes it even clearer. In the article I just linked to, it makes it clearer. The fire is God. He is the fire. And as such, it's his uncreated energy. Because you understand in Orthodox theology, you have the essence energies distinction. The energies or the works of God are uncreated. So you can say that the fire of God is God and emanates from God and it's not created. And what's ironic, isn't that what I showed you yesterday? I showed you in scripture yesterday in part four, the fire that burns hell is God. God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29. He is the fire, right, that ignites hell because in his anger, a fire is ignited. That was Deuteronomy 32, 22, Jeremiah 15, verse 14, Jeremiah 15, verse 14. Isaiah 33, 14, and I also prove God is present everywhere, even in hell. And surprise, surprise, that's what the Orthodox Church teaches. I didn't know this, honestly. But glory to God that the same spirit that's filling them, I pray he's filling us, and he's filling me, and guiding me to the fullness of the truth as he is, these brothers and sisters in Christ in these churches. So, to them, heaven and hell are not places, they're experiences. It's the same fire, but that fire will impact you depending on your attitude and disposition. And the analogy he gave of wood and gold, even in that article that I linked to, is taken from 1 Corinthians 3, 11 and 15, which they cite. Paul says that on that day, our works will be tested by fire. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 and 15. Our works will be tested by fire. If your work is gold and silver, it will go through the fire purified and purged and cleansed, not destroyed. But if it's wood, hay, or straw, it will be consumed, right? So this is the view of hell and heaven. The fire of God is one and the same, uncreated. It emanates from him. But its effect on you depends on your disposition attitude. If you reject God, then the fire consumes you. But if you love God, the fire illuminates, purifies you. This is the orthodox position. And this fire that will either purify, purge you, or consume you is never ending. And you heard him say something else, what I just said. Do you hear what he just said? He just said, the orthodox church does not believe we are immortal by nature. We are created with the gift of immortality. Exactly. So there you go. What's my point as we're preparing for all this? What's my point? My point is simple. If the Lord has convinced you, if the Lord has convinced you, yeah, this guy, boxing, you are stupider than your whore mother who slept with the Shia. Get the hell out of here, dude. All right, anyway. Was this a guy a Muslim? Hold on. Did I just block a wrong person? Was this guy a Muslim? Is he a Muslim? I think not. I think he's a Christian. So why would he say something so stupid? Are you a Christian man? Hold on. Are you a, the Christian that was here yesterday? Hold on. No. No, I think it is because I recognize his name. See, this is what happens when you chime in. Are you that Christian that was here yesterday? Let me just tell you. See, this is what happens when you talk. So if you're a Christian, I have to apologize. I thought you're a Muslim, but I'm still going to block you nonetheless. So I just unhit him. So let's see if it's him. Anyway, you got to be especially challenged to think there are four uncreated. No. Okay. Boxing God. You know, I'm going to have to block you. I apologize. I thought you're a Muslim, but you're a Christian. I won't, but I'm going to block you anyway. Because you do not say four uncreated things because the fire of God would be one of his characteristics like his mercy, love, compassion. You don't say these characteristics are persons, so you have now a hundred persons in God. 
Why would you say that? I have no idea. How is fire equated to a person only in your world? The father is a person. The son is a person. The spirit is a person. Three hypostases, hypostases. But fire is not a person any more than light is a person, any more than love is a person. It's a characteristic, a quality that the persons possess by virtue of having the same nature. Do I really need to explain that to you, boxing? Why would you assume a characteristic, a work of God, a working of God, an energy of God, a quality of God is a person? Lord have mercy on me. Why would you assume that? Do you understand, you guys, what this is? The energies are God's workings, his characteristics, his attributes. These are the attributes, characteristics common to the nature. And since the Father's nature is the Son's nature and the Spirit's nature, these are their common characteristics, qualities, and energies. Okay? I don't know what the boxing God means. Yeah. Just boxing God. Chime in less because I don't recognize you yet. Thankfully, I remembered you from yesterday because if you've been here for a while, then I'll recognize you. Thank the Lord I remind you from yesterday because I thought you're a Shia. Anyway, or a Sunni. Like Muhammad Khan who got molested by his uncle. I didn't know that. But I remembered someone with that name yesterday who was praising God. So I go, wait, wait, wait. Is that him? Now for the rest of you, did you get it? You guys got it? You understand what the Orthodox and Catholic position is? So the Orthodox settled. This is their view. You don't like it? Leave the Orthodox Church. Don't bring your Protestantism into Orthodoxy. Catholic Church, settle. You don't like it? Leave. Don't bring your Protestantism into the Catholic Church. Meaning, if you of your own volition, as you sought the face of the Spirit, and the Spirit convinced you, go Orthodox, go Catholic, then the Spirit expects you now to submit. No one forced you. Even the Spirit in His love doesn't force you. He will convict you. He'll draw you. It may even discipline you, but if you keep resisting, then you reach a point of reprobation. You now blaspheme the spirit. It's over for you. Okay? So those of you who became orthodox, this is your position. That's it. All right, God. My thoughts, I subject to the church. I will now correct my thinking to align itself with the church because you have convinced me in working with my volition this is the true church. No one forced me to come, so I will humble myself and submit. Likewise with the Catholic faith. Is everyone with me there? Exactly, Masihi. I like that. Did we get that point? Why do I say that? Because of 1 Timothy 3.15. This is why I say the Bible was given to the church the Lord Jesus established. Okay? It is the church that upholds the Bible and God's revelation and preserves it, explains it, defends it, articulates it, and dies for it. The church. 1 Timothy 3.15. Let me read the Revised Standard Version. We'll use the Catholic edition. They don't have an Orthodox edition, but it's all right. Here you go. I'm going to read it. Now, I can't copy and paste, brethren, so bear with me. I'm just going to read. That's fine. The beautiful thing about Creative Studio is that less time for you to hear me. But I'm not able to do the screen share because it's limited characters. It only limits how much you can post. 1 Timothy 3.15. If I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark, the pillar and foundation of the truth. There you go. What is the church? Brethren? What is the church? The church is is the pillar and the bulwark, the foundation of the truth. What is the truth? Well, God is the truth, and his word is the truth, and the Bible is his word, therefore it's the truth. So here you're told from the very Bible itself, Protestants, the Bible is given to the church, not to an individual to decide to pontificate on the meaning of Scripture and then condemn others who doesn't agree with his or her thinking. 
The Bible is the book of the community of the redeemed, born of the Spirit, washed in the blood, sealed by the Spirit, united to Christ, called the church. We got it? Called the church. Are you with me there? Focus, brethren. No pontificate. I need you to focus because there's a lot to cover. You see, I didn't even go into the scriptural data because there's a lot to cover. I mentioned references to God being a fire, and that fire comes from him. I'm going to give you some more references. So what's the point of 1 Timothy 3.15? The point of 3.15 is the truth has been entrusted to the care of church, the spiritual body of Christ, the bride of Christ. All right. Since the church has been established and being built from the time of the apostles, don't you guys want to know <coughs> what that ancient church, ancient church looked like historically? Because even Protestantism acknowledges their tradition goes no further than the 16th century. All right. Doesn't that trouble you, Protestants? Troubles me. What was the history of the church beyond the Reformation? What did the church look like from the time of the apostles onward? And if you investigate, you will leave Protestantism. That's just a fact. You will. Not saying it to offend people. But then the only options are the Orthodox Church, meaning its various permutations, or the Catholic Church. And in the case of the Assyrians, you got the Assyrian Church, even though they're in schism, the Oriental Orthodox with the Eastern Orthodox and the Assyrian Church were all in schism because of certain theological articulations and terminology. But still, they will all acknowledge the other as being ancient, though fallen away. See the difference? The Oriental Orthodox will admit the Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox. They're ancient, but they erred along the way, right? Catholic will acknowledge all of them, the Assyrian Church as well, as ancient, but they made some mistakes all, all along the way. Same with the Eastern Orthodox. So they're all acknowledging these are ancient, but they ended up making mistakes along the way, breaking fellowship, ending up in schism. Are you with me there? But all of them agree that's not the case with Protestantism, and even Protestantism agrees that's not the case with Protestantism. Therefore, let me remind you, if God has convinced you, exit out of Protestantism, these churches have settled the matter for you. That means there is no rethinking hell in the Orthodox Church. There is no four views of hell in the Catholic Church. These are the result and the fruit of sola scriptura, tota scriptura, because of the magisterial deformers. Am I making sense? Please let me know if it's really blessing you because I really want to be used of the spirit of blessing. And if he's using me, you'll be blessed. I almost feel like I'm torturing you because I can't stand hearing myself. This is why I affirm everlasting conscious torment. Why? Because my path is leading me to these traditions that affirm it. And once I'm in, that's it. I'm not going to question it. Once I settle, that's it. I will now submit myself to the Holy Spirit and what he has led that church to codify by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ, not for the praise of men. All right. Now, let's talk about more examples of God being that fire that consumes. Being that fire that consumes. Right? Let me give you the link. Let me give you a link. Well, I can't give you a link. I'm sorry. This is not StreamYard. I'm just going to read them for you guys. Okay? Remember... The better for Creative Studio, there's less time, less lag. But the problem is that I'm not able to copy and paste. But that's okay. Let me now go through all the verses where we're told that God is a fire that consumes. And then we're going to go into the nature of hell and the duration of hell and the challenges exegetically. Why then you have to settle for the church that you're convinced is used of the Lord. All right. That God is the fire that consumes. Are we ready? Are we ready? Good. All right. Now, brethren, 
don't start a debate in the comment section. Well, God led me to the Orthodox Church or God led me to the Catholic Church. You're going to start debates in the comment section. I accept all churches that are Trinitarian who love Jesus Christ and affirm the Bible's God's perfect word. Even Protestant evangelicals. I do hate Calvinism, and there are certain Calvinists that I think are false teachers, but they're Calvinists who are sincerely looking to please God, and they're confused. I show them mercy. And if you're ancient, meaning you belong to the ancient traditions, this is your channel. So let's not start debates in the comment section. Okay? Brethren, glorify God for anything good I've done. I'm seeing a lot of comments where you think me. Let me be honest. I'm not being humble. Glorify the Father, Son, Holy Spirit for anything good I, I've done because that's the Holy Spirit enabling me to do it. And if you love me, then ask the Holy Spirit to seal me and preserve me in his infinite power to never fall away, but to love Jesus Christ perfectly till the end and never fall into any scandal, God forbid, and restore my daughters. Okay, let's go into God being the fire. Are we ready? Marcy Lynn, may the Lord guide you in your journey. God being the fire. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 and 3. By the way, Catholic Biblicist, what did you think of my response? Response to Stephen Sissy's point in my, my blog. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 and 3. Let me read it. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 and 3. When Solomon had ended his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of Yahuwah filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of Yahuwah because of the glory of Yahuwah filled Yahuwah's house. When all the children of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of Yahuwah upon the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the earth on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to Yahuwah, saying, For he is good, for steadfast love, love endures forever. Did you catch it? When Solomon built the temple and dedicated it, God appeared in a pillar of cloud. God appeared in a pillar of cloud. And when the pillar of cloud appeared, fire came out of the cloud to consume the sacrifices, which was God's way of saying, I accept this temple and your sacrifices. Who was the fire? God. The fire emanated from whom? God. The fire issued from whom? God. Here's how you refute it, brother. Okay, here you go. This is how you refute it. For being that stupid, stupid trash who doesn't know how to defend your faith and asking me a question not related to my topic. Get the hell out of here, dude, you piece of garbage. Lord rebuke you and chasten you to teach you discipline. May have mercy on all of us. Now, for the rest of you, you with me there? So who is the fire? God. The fire emanates from whom? God. All right. Well, that's one of them. Second Chronicles 7, verses 1 to 3. Leviticus 10, verses 1 to 8. This one's a little scary. Leviticus 10, verses 1 to 7. I'm sorry. This one's a little scary. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 7. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 to 7. Okay? God had commanded Aaron and his sons, Nadab and Abihu, Abihu, to make a certain mixture for the incense. Listen to this. God told them, this is the mixture for my incense. So he already gave them instructions. Nadab and Abihu, or Abihu, decided to take shortcuts. Look what God did to them. Pay attention, brethren, because this tells you the fire is God. He's a consuming fire, and the fire emanates from him. Okay, you listening? Nadab and Abihu, Abihu, which Abi means my father is he, decided to make the incense with a different mixture, not prescribed by God, even though they knew better. And this teaches a principle. The more you know, the greater responsibility. The more you receive, the greater your judgment if you then act contrarily to God's will. So he makes an example out of them. Leviticus 10, verses 1 to 7. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unholy fire before Yahuwah, such as he had not commanded them. And fire came forth from the presence of Yahuwah. Presence means his face, and devoured them. That's the fire. Catch it? What is the fire? God is the fire. And devoured them. 
right? Devoured them and they died before Yahuwah. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what Yahuwah has said. I will show myself holy among those who are near me and before all the people I'll be glorified. In other words, I'm, I'm showing you by example, don't mess with me. See the principle? Don't mess with me. Don't play with me. Don't do things your own way. Don't decide to take matters into your own hand and you come up with your own way of worshiping me. If I've made my will clear and I've told you, here's how you are to approach me and worship me, you better not dare do it your own way, Protestants, lest my fire, my wrath is kindled and my fire consumes you. You see the, the point? What do you learn here, Protestants? God is saying, you better follow my prescribed will. Worship me the way I've told you to. Don't worship me according to your whims and desires and come up with your own way of approaching me. I will not tolerate it. That's the lesson they learn. You caught it? You understand what the lesson is? It's not everyone does it his own way and approaches God the way he thinks is most effective. No, you approach me the way I have revealed to you. I've given you my word. I've given you my will. I've made my worship clear what my will is for you. Clear. How dare you then invent new ways or other ways to approach it me? Because now you're defying me and opposing me to my face. Do you see it? And that's what orthodox means. The right way, the straight path. Orthodox is the correct path, the right way, the straight path. You know that? That's what the word means? You Greek speakers can confirm? Isn't it a sad state of affairs in the church today? We have nearly 40,000 denominations all doing it their own way and thinking their way is God's way, making Christianity a laughing stock in the eyes of the unbelieving world where we can't get along. Yep. So let's finish it. Look what it says. And Aaron held this peace. His two sons were killed by fire. That's a sign of the fire of judgment. And he could do nothing about it but be still. And Moses called Mishael and El Zafan, God of the North. The sons of Uzil, Uz, I believe that means strength, right? My strength is God. The uncle of Aaron, don't quote me on that, I'm just trying to associate the names, and said to them, draw near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So go drag their dead carcasses out of the camp. So they drew near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eliezer and Ithamar, his sons, his other two, do not let the hair of your hand, heads hang loose and do not rend your clothes. Don't mourn. Do not mourn for your brothers, lest you die and lest wrath come upon all the congregation. But your brethren, the whole of Israel, may bewail the burning which Jehovah, Yehovah has kindled. He kindled it. And do not go out from the door of the tent of meeting, lest you die, for the anointing oil of Yahuwah is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. That was Leviticus 10, verses 1 to 7. Okay. Other examples of God being the fire, being the consuming fire. Other examples. This one is a little lengthy, so let me skip. Let me go to 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 9 to 16. I want to give the, the best for last. They're all good. I don't mean to speak in a way which seems to denigrate Scripture. Scripture is perfect from cover to cover. Some portions are harder to understand than others. That's a given. 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 9 to 16. What or who is the fire? God. God is the fire. He is the consuming fire. The fire is his anger, and it animates from him. Okay, are you with me? Raphael, if you want me to block you, I'll, I'll, I'll block you and I'll answer the question and block you. That's what you want. All right. 
Let me see if I'm too loud. Let me just see one second. So 2 Kings 1, verses 9 and 16. Let's read. King, The king sent a deputation to Elijah to bring him before the king. So 2 Kings 1, 9 and 16. Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 men with his 50. He went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. So you're being ordered. The king says, hey, you better come, buddy. But Elijah answered the captain 50, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Where do you think that fire came from, brethren? Where do you think that fire came from? It came from heaven. From who in heaven? From who in heaven? God. You see the fire is God. He's the fire. He's the source of the fire. It emanates from him. There you go. Well, let's finish it. Yeah, here you go. Well, let me, let me, let me see. Shut the hell up. Return to your vomit. Return to the Shah who slept with your mother, the whore. Get the hell out of here, dude. Again, the king sent him another captain of 50 men with his 50. And he went up and said to him, oh, man of God, this is the king's order. Say, hey, man, this is the king's order. You better come. That's why we're here. Otherwise, he's going to take you by force. See, they're coming, threatening him. You better listen to the king or else. Oh, really? Okay. Come down quickly. But Elijah answered them, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you in your 50. Then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him in his 50. Mm. The third group learned their lesson. Again, the king sent the captain of a third 50 with his 50. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. He learned his lesson. Hey, 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 whoa. Hey, man. I come in peace. I come in peace. I don't want to be in pieces. I saw what happened to the other two. When they threatened you, you better come or else. God then destroyed them in his wrath. Please, Elijah, I come in peace. Please. I'm not making you do anything. I'm not forcing you to do anything. I come in peace. Oh, man of God, I pray you, let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Lo, fire came down from heaven and consumed the two former captains of 50 men with their 50s. But now let my life, my soul be precious in your sight. Now watch, who speaks to Elijah? Then the angel of the Lord, Yahuwah, said to Elijah, go down with him and do not be afraid of him. That's Jesus, folks. That's Jesus. Jesus is the messenger of God, the angel meaning messenger of God, sent by God, who is God. You see? You understood the difference. When the third group came humbly with a fearful, reverent disposition, knowing God is with Elijah, knowing that God fights for Elijah, knowing not to mess with the servant of God, because you mess with God, and they came humbly and fearfully, God showed them mercy. And the angel of the Lord said, don't worry about it, go with them. So he arose and went down with him to the king and said to him, thus says Yahuwah, because you have sent messenger inquire of Baal Zebub, you made the mistake of going and inquire of the false god Baal, the god of Ekron. Is it because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone, but you shall surely die because he was sick in bed. Okay. Are you seeing all these examples of fire coming from God, from heaven, from his presence? That the biblical teaching is the fire that burns and consumes, the fire of hell is ignited by God. He is the fire. The fire is his anger that's kindled. He's the consuming fire. Right? And the fire represents his anger at sin, his hate of sin and evil. And that's my last example. My last example of the fire. My last example of the fire. And I'm going to have to do a part 5C. Part 5C. Last example of the fire. 
is First Kings, the one that Kirele Yusun was asking. First Kings chapter 18, it's a long one, 20 to 40. 20 to 40. Let me break it down. First Kings 18, 20 to 27. Okay, let's read. 20 to 27. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Because Elijah said, bring the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of Estart, Ishtar, about 400. And we're going to have a showdown on Mount Carmel. We're going to see whose God is God. Watch here. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping with two different opinions? Limping is because, hmm, hmm, you get it? Limping. Turn to the right, turn to the left, like you're limping. How long are you going to vacillate between two views? If Yahuwah is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. So if Yahuwah is God, follow him. If Allah of Muhammad is God, follow him. But you can't have both. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I, only am left a prophet of the Lord, Yahuwah. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. Ironic, because bull is associated with Baal as well. And let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of Yahuwah. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Watch. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first. For you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire to it. Now watch here. And they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered, because God muted that demon, that Satan, that evil spirit. Muted him, because all creatures are in the hands of God. Even the demons, even Satan, muted them. They couldn't respond. And they limped about the altar which they had made, limping, crawling, begging, crying out. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, a man after my heart. Let me show you what he says. 1 Kings 18, 27. Watch here. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, cry aloud, for he's a God. Shout, he's a God. Surely he's a God. Either he is musing or he has gone aside. You know what musing means? Either he's asleep or he went to the bathroom. Literally, the word gone aside means he went to the call of nature. So literally what Elijah said, either he's asleep, you got to wake him up, or he's taking a crap. He's taking a shat. He's on the toilet, not lying. That's what it means. But I don't see Jesus in you, Elijah. Where's Jesus in you? I don't see the love of Jesus. Where's Jesus in you, Elijah? I don't see you being Christ like. Don't you know you got to love them, Renee? Renee, you got to love them, Renee. Renee, Renee. You got to be Jesus to them. I don't find the love of Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Brother Johnny loved Jesus. Brother Tony, I love Jesus. Brother Tim, you love Jesus. Brother John, I love Jesus. And yeah, I'm not lying to you. It means go to the bathroom. Here, let me show you other translations. 1 Kings 18, 27. I know you guys think I'm lying. Here it goes. Here's a link. 1 Kings 18, 27. Different translations. Here you go. I love you, Jesus. I don't see Jesus in you. Where is Jesus in you? Where is Jesus in you? Where is Jesus in you? Because he first loved me. Okay. Contemporary English version. 
Oh, how I love Jesus. Contemporary English version. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. At noon, Elijah began making fun of them. Pray louder. He said, Baal must be a god. Maybe he's daydreaming or using the toilet or traveling somewhere. Or maybe he's asleep or you have to wake him up. Toilet. So musing means daydreaming, right? I said sleep, but technically daydreaming is to be in a state of sleep, technically. But you got it, right? Maybe he's in the toilet, people. Maybe he's relieving his, he's Maybe he shat over himself. Shat. Okay, but hold on. Let me give you another translation. Another one will say relieving himself. Here you go. ESV. Then I'll give you one that says bathroom. That he went to the bathroom. Maybe he just shat on himself, mister. First Kings 18, 20. I'm not lying. Here it goes. You see it? English Standard Version. Cry aloud, for he's a god. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself. Maybe he's urinating. He's taking a piss. Maybe he's shatting. I just shat myself. Oh, my goodness. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. All right. Now, what about bathroom? Is there a translation as bathroom? Are you kidding me, Sammy? There's a translation that says bathroom. Yep. It's the Lexham English Bible. You're kidding me, Sammy. What the hell is going on here? Here you go, Sammy. Damn you, Sammy. Damn you. Oh, how I love Jesus. Perhaps he is meditating or he is using the bathroom. Say what? Are you kidding me? Or is on a journey. Perhaps he's asleep and must wake up. You caught it? Relieving himself. Bathroom. Right? On the toilet. Shat. Hold on, dude. Can't you see I'm on the toilet? I got to take a shat. Because I just sharted myself. And I just did pee-pee in my panties. Oh, Brother John, you love Jesus. Yes, Tim, I love Jesus. What about you, Tony? You love Jesus. But I don't see Jesus in you. You're making fun of people. That's not what Christ would have you do. Okay. We now, you see the sad state of the church today? You see how pathetic the church has become? where we produced a type of Christianity that says you need to be an effeminate sissy, a spineless coward, because that's what Jesus wants you to be. Right? Now let's go back to the point. So now he makes fun of them. Now watch the connection with Momo, Muhammad, and, and Islam. So that was 27. Now let's continue. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. Did you catch it? Is it ironic that the Shia to this day, in honor of the martyrdom of Hussein, Muhammad's grandson, Karbala, you'll see them go into a demonic frenzy where they take knives and swords and cut themselves bleeding and they'll do it to their children? Go to Google. Type in Shia Karbala cutting. You'll even see them taking a knife and cutting the forehead of a, their baby, gushing with blood in commemoration of Hussein being murdered at the instigation of Yazid, Yazid ibn <clears throat> Muawiyah, his army. What more proof do you want? Islam is from the pit of hell. It's bow worship. Okay? So there you go. Now let's finish what happens though. The fire, that was the point. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, until three o'clock in the afternoon. Three o'clock in the afternoon, from noon to three o'clock, but there was no voice. No one answered, no one heeded. Three o'clock at the afternoon. 
And Elisha, Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of Yahuwah, Jehovah, that had been thrown down. Did you catch it? Israel had become so wicked, abominable, idolatrous, they had even destroyed the altar, which they offered sacrifice to God, because they replaced the worship of God with the worship of Baal. And Elijah had to restore it. And now it's 3 o'clock at the afternoon, time of evening prayer and sacrifice. Look what God does. Elijah took 12 stones. Now let's see if you understand the spiritual significance and symbolism. Elijah took 12 stones. Why 12 stones? The 12 tribes of Israel. Pay attention. 12 stones. 12 tribes of Israel. According to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of Yahuwah came saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of Yahuwah. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as wood contained two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water, and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did a third time. Now count. Let's see if you know the math. And the water ran around about the altar and filled the trench also with water. Let's see if you know the math. Four what? Four jars of water. They filled it and they poured it on the altar three times. That's 12. 12. Are you catching it? A bull sacrifice cut in pieces. 12 stones, 12 tribes. Four jars of water. Poured three times, 12. Water, sacrifice, fire. Water, sacrifice, fire. Sacrifice, water, and fire. Hmm. Water, baptism. Sacrifice, the blood of Christ, and a fire that will either purge you or consume you in God's wrath. What? What? And why 12? Because the nation is being purified, purged by the sacrifice, the blood, by the water, and purged by the fire of their idolatry and sin. What? Is it all making sense? Well, keep praying for me, kiddos, and to be filled with the Spirit. As He fills me, I'll pour into your lives, I promise. Right? All right. Well, let's finish. And at the time of the offering of Lation, do you guys understand when the fire will come? Time of the offering of Lation. Three o'clock, evening sacrifice, evening prayer, a bull sacrifice, a burnt offering, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Yahuwah, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Answer me, O Yahuwah, answer me, that this people may know that thou, O Yahuwah, art God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back. You're drawing them back. If you resist, it's over for you. Then the fire of Yahuwah. The Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. That means God accepted their baptism and their sacrifice and purged them of their sins by his purifying fire. So their symbolic baptism was accepted. Their sacrifice, the shedding of blood, was accepted. So God accepted them and forgave them and now was purging them by his purifying fire, which can consume them if they turn. What? Oh, how I love Jesus. And then what happens? And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, Yahuwah, he is God. Yahuwah, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them. Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and killed them there. 
I don't see Jesus in you, Elijah. Where's Jesus? I don't see the love of Jesus in you. How could you kill? Aren't you supposed to pray for them, Elijah? Elijah, you're supposed to pray and tell them I love you. You know I love you. And I'll pray for you. I'll pray for your soul. Hey, Tim. I love them. Let's pray. Oh, it's okay. Oh, Lord, have mercy on the prophets of back. I don't think Jesus and Elijah. Where's Jesus? Elijah, do you love Jesus? Yes, I love Jesus. Well, tell me if you love Jesus. Yes, I'll tell you I love Jesus. Then why did you kill those buffoons? Oh, how could you love Jesus? Oh, how could you love Jesus? Oh, how could you love Jesus when you done slaughtered those buffoons? All right, there you go. Have we established from Scripture, God is the fire? God, <laughs> what he 26 just said, because I'm going to shut myself. Stop, all right? You made me laugh on that one. God is the fire? God is the fire. The Orthodox Church nailed it. And unbeknownst to me, I didn't know that's what the Orthodox Church taught. Honest before my Lord, that I'm going to give an account to. I just learned today the Orthodox Church taught God is present everywhere. He fills heaven and earth. He fills hell as well. And he is the fire. It's one of his uncreated energies. I didn't know that. It is refreshing to find confirmation. From something you discovered in scripture by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the fire. The fire is his anger that is kindled. And that fire can purify and purge or destroy and consume. All right. So there you go. We're done with part 5B. Lord willing, I'll call it part 5C tomorrow. Because now you're ready for the nature and duration of hell. And then we're going to wrap it up, God willing. You see why I took my time? You see why I'm going very slow. I'm treading lightly and reverently. Sensitive topic that I have to be very careful what I say because I'm going to give an answer to the Lord. And you see why we are getting attacked by demons and trolls. Pray that I find a way to work out StreamYard where this bastard, son of a Shia whore, won't be able to use a bot to spam us. Pray I'll figure it out today, God willing, with your prayers. So I just want to know. Were you guys blessed, honestly, in spite of distractions? And you got to watch part five with part five B. Yep. Were you guys blessed? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit was present and working through me? If it is, give him the glory and pray for me that the Spirit will seal me as he seals you. Did you learn a lot about the nature of Sola Scriptura, Tota Scriptura, and the confusion and differences which will cause, cause you to vacillate and never be certain of any one position. And you see that the Bible is clear. The Bible is the church's book entrusted to the Bible, 1 Timothy 3.15. And the church is the pillar and foundation of the Bible. God will use his church and empower church to preserve the Bible, to copy the Bible, to explain the Bible which the church has been doing since the time of the apostles, not since the time of the Reformation. And why, once you're convinced that the church that you have now embraced, that's the church of Christ, you must now repent of your thought and subject your thinking to what the church says, because a body of sanctified, spirit-filled minds is better than one mind. Right? Rather trust a collective body of spirit-filled teachers and leaders, bishops, who are truly men of God and not wolves, when they conclude this is what the church, the faithful, is supposed to believe, then your own thinking, because if you then question them, you're making your intellect, your knowledge, your understanding, ultimate authority, you're making your wisdom, your interpretation, <clears throat> the criterion of truth, and your sitting judgment, upon everyone else. So you're becoming your own Pope. May we never do that. May God purge me of that. 
may empower me to practice what I preach and act upon the word. And I pray that for you, for the glory of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Now, guys, if you love me for the sake of the Lord, you know what to do. You pray your words, you know what to do. Beg the Lord Jesus to bring my daughters this year. Said I'm with them every day. Beg the Lord Jesus to remove Martin Simon Yako, this adulterous man married to an adulterous woman, and that he'll convict her to repent and get rid of the marriage. If she truly loves the Lord and repents, as she says, she knows she can't be married. She's been told to protect my daughters from this wicked, evil influence and heal my heart, not to be bitter, and be patient on the Lord, to be with them every day. Cry out to the Lord that if he tarries, I can raise them up in the love of the Lord. And I go home first and ask the Lord to grant us divine, miraculous, physical safety, security, protection, and health to give me the power to stay healthy and fit and use it to glorify the Lord. My daughters are healthy and in love with Jesus. The most important thing that we love Jesus and I'm a doer of his word and not fall into any scandal. May the Lord save me from that. And do pray for the support that I don't lose support. It stays steady and I use it for the glory of Christ. And if that happens, I promise you, I'll continue to serve you to the best of my ability, trusting the spirit, being open to the voice of spirit and submitting to the voice of spirit to teach you the things he wants me to teach you. He's a teacher. We are his disciples. And I love you for the sake of Christ. Father, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will return definitely to the earth, physical body. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Save us. Seal us. Our loved ones, my daughters, even their mother. May she fully repent. In Jesus' name, name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Maranatha. Take care, guys.